Okay, so in this video, I'm going to begin uh, a series of many lectures discussing uh, metabolism and the various uh, mechanisms of energy conversion. Um, and metabolism <clears throat> can be broken down into two subtypes. Right? Those are catabolism um, and anabolism. And we will spend the majority of our time in this course discussing catabolic pathways. Uh, or those that involve the breakdown of complex biomolecules such as carbohydrates into simpler organic compounds, including pyruvate, which we will see at the end of glycolysis, and carbon dioxide, we will see that during the TCA cycle. <clears throat> so if we're making a compound such as CO2, where there are four bonds between carbon and oxygen, where that carbon is in the plus four oxidation state, that we would say this is process is oxidative with respect to the carbon atom. During oxidation reactions, we can view this oxidation as a process that decreases the number of CH bonds and or increases the number of CO bonds. Of course, something else must be oxidized if carbon is reduced and vice versa, but we're going to talk about oxidation and reduction with respect to the organic substrate uh, or the carbohydrates such as glucose. So there are a few different examples I want to discuss uh, and later on we will do them in detail. So catabolism involves um, processes such as glycolysis, the TCA or the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. And glycolysis occurs in the cytosol of each cell. The TCA cycle is an aerobic process that depends on consumption of electron carriers at the electron transport chain. And aerobic respiration occurs in the mitochondrial matrix, the very inner part of the mitochondria. And the electron transport chain occurs in the mitochondrial inner membrane. So catabolism is going to release energy that was stored in the glucose molecule in the form of electron carriers like um, NADH and enzyme bound FADH2. So those are our reducing agents that we will see. We will also build high energy triphosphate compounds such as ATP and GTP. So let's juxtapose catabolism with anabolism. Anabolism is now uh, the buildup or the putting together of simpler organic molecules to form more complex molecules such as polymers like glycogen or highly reduced species like fatty acids. Glycogen we will see later is going to be a polymer that stores glucose when glucose levels are high. And fatty acids are these long hydrophobic carbon chains that have a polar carboxyl end. And they are highly reduced as each of these methylene units has two CH bonds. So these processes store energy in the form of highly reduced CH bonds. So they are reductive with respect to carbon. Um, and therefore, when we're building a fatty acid or glycogen, we will do reduction and increase the number of CH bonds or decrease the number of CO bonds. Some examples of anabolic processes include glycogen synthesis. We will explore that towards the end of this unit. That occurs in the liver, largely. 
um, gluconeogenesis, which is the synthesis of glucose from two pyruvate molecules that occur that occurs in the cytosol um, with a reaction or two that are in the mitochondria. But most of those enzymes are in cytosol. And then fatty acid synthesis is another example, which we will not talk about too much in this course. And that occurs in the cytosol. So anabolism is going to store energy by consuming electron carriers or reducing agents like NADH and or enzyme bound FADH2. And they will also be processes that require the input or consume ATP and or GTP. So let's talk about uh, this oxidation that I've been alluding to, um, where nature's oxidizing agent that we're going to see most commonly is NAD+, but we will also see FAD, which is enzyme bound. So, NAD plus and FAD are going to take electrons from organic substrates and be reduced to NADH and enzyme bound FADH2, where they now have extra hydrogens and they have been reduced. So the organic substrate that the hydrogens were stolen from have been oxidized. And now these reduced electron carriers are going to serve as such and take electron density to the electron transport chain at the inner membrane of the mitochondria, where they will release electrons for ATP synthesis to occur. That process that we will do, where we oxidize them back to their oxidized form and synthesize ATP as a byproduct is known as oxidative phosphorylation. So electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation are linked in the mitochondria. So we're gonna work our way there. So recall that oxidation means you're adding more CO bonds or any carbon bound to an electronegative atom is an oxidized carbon or removing hydrogens from carbon. Alternatively, we can think of um, reduction as adding more hydrogens or decreasing the number of CO bonds. So let's look at the mechanism by which NAD plus serves as an electron sink or an oxidant. So if you start with ethanol, the reaction that metabolizes ethanol upon ingestion is that of alcohol dehydrogenase. And we will see that many enzyme names are required uh, by memory in this course, uh, but dehydrogenase means that it can take hydrogen away or do oxidation. But if reversible, which many of the dehydrogenase enzymes are, it can also add hydrogen back and do reduction. So refer to dehydrogenase as not just oxidation, but overall a redox enzyme. And there are two CH bonds at this primary alcohol, where this alcohol has one bond to an electronegative atom, or it's in the plus one oxidation state. And the oxidation process is going to be removal of hydrogen to reach acetaldehyde where there are two bonds between carbon and oxygen or this is in the plus two oxidation state. The hydrogen that is on the oxygen is acidic and will be lost as H plus. Whenever we produce NADH, H plus will be the byproduct. That hydrogen is lost by breaking the OH bond. This will form a carbonyl as a base deprotonates that hydrogen. And 
H minus is also lost, where this electron density here between C and H is going to be the electron pair or hydrogen with two electrons that attacks the position para to the nitrogen, which is an electron sink. So the nitrogen is a convenient acceptor of electrons because now the nitrogen is alleviated of its positive charge and becomes an sp3 hybridized non-aromatic system. So what we have done is we've taken this orange pair of electron density away from the alcohol substrate. <clears throat> and this proton was already here in the beginning. That has not changed. And H minus is the hydride that is lost from the carbonyl carbon, while H plus is the acidic proton that is lost. So we lose two protons and two electrons, but one is this H plus and one is H minus with two, both of the electrons. And this is now known as NADH, the reduced form. And the reaction's reversible, right? For example, if you push the electrons back to preserve aromaticity or restore aromaticity, then attack at the carbonyl would give the alcohol starting material. And that's what we're going to do below. So if you start now with NADH, where there are two protons here, NADH is going to act as an electron source or a reducing agent, also known as reductant, where that nitrogen lone pair can form a pi bond, CC pi bond forms, and the H minus does nucleophilic addition at the carbonyl, which can then protonate with an acidic proton, H plus. This might happen in a multi-step mechanism, but we are just looking at the end result here. So now go back to C single bond O, where there are two CH bonds of that alcohol. And thus we have been reduced from plus two, now down to plus one where the H minus is now the CH and the H plus is now the OH. And this reforms the pyridinium type ring where the positive charge is reinstalled at this nitrogen. And that is now aromatic again, which is the driving force. So NAD plus is the byproduct of reduction. Once again, this is catalyzed by the same alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme. So not only are reducing agents and oxidizing agents going to be of great concern during this unit, but so are high energy phosphate compounds. We're going to see the phosphorylation as a key reaction to understand uh, in glycolysis um, and gluconeogenesis especially. So uh, there are three different phosphate containing functionalities here and I have them in, in terms of relative energy. Where the one on the far left, the phosphoanhydride is less stable than the acyl phosphate, which is less stable than the alkyl phosphate. So in other words, this carbon oxygen bond here is strong and it's hard to break. And really, maybe I should say the PO bonds, since we're comparing the stability of the phosphorus atoms. 
So that's a strong PO bond, stabilized by several uh, equivalent resonance forms. But this phosphorus oxygen bond is weaker, and this phosphorus oxygen bond is the weakest of the series. So you should view uh, this as being part of carbonyl reactivity, where the most reactive carboxylic acid derivative was that of an acyl chloride. And the reason it was so reactive is because the chloride was a great leaving group. And in this case, you can break off one of the phosphates or one of the phosphoryl groups from the phosphoanhydride and you get a resonance stabilized leaving group. You make this alkyl phosphate. So we will see that compounds uh, such as tri and diphosphates like ADP and ATP have these high energy phosphoanhydride bonds that undergo very exergonic hydrolysis. The leaving group of an acyl phosphate, okay, where acyl refers to carbonyl, this is resonant stabilized leaving group. And it's pretty good at leaving. We'll say it's a moderate leaving group, whereas the first alkyl phosphate was a good leaving group because it is resonant stabilized. But the alkyl phosphate is an alcohol leaving group, which is a pretty strong base. So it's a poor leaving group. And that's why it's hard to break the PO bond. So we will see that it is irreversible to go from phosphoanhydrides to alkyl phosphates. And we will do that process multiple times during uh, glycolysis. And anytime you're moving from left to right, from phosphoanhydride to acyl phosphate, right? alkyl phosphate, then you're going to be going downhill. And the phosphate containing compound in the product will be more stable than the starting materials were. So um, ATP is the universal high energy source that we're going to spend so much time talking about. GTP is an analogous compound with a different nitrogenous base. So ATP has these three phosphoryl groups, which are connected through phosphoanhydride-like functionality, where the terminal oxygen has two O minuses and the others each have one. And the phosphate closest to the ribose sugar is the alpha, beta, and gamma is furthest. And generally, it is this terminal phosphate or terminal phosphoryl, which is transferred to and from various substrates during kinase catalyzed reactions or phosphate transfer reactions in glycolysis. So if you are asked to track the phosphate that is being transferred, it's usually the gamma one until we get to processes later in the course, such as a glycolysis and nucleic acid synthesis that will change a bit later on. So we just mentioned this is a very unstable compound because of the negative four net charge, extensive electrostatic repulsion between the oxygens, and the high energy or weak phosphoanhydride bonds. So the hydrolysis of ATP, or when water attacks and breaks a phosphorus oxygen bond, specifically it attacks the gamma phosphate, this is a very extragonic process that releases about 30 kilojoules per mole, and therefore it is highly irreversible. So 
we're going to see that, that hydrolysis or the cleavage of a phosphoanhydride bond from ATP can release a lot of energy that can be used to do cellular work and overcome otherwise endergonic processes. So that's why it is valuable to build a sufficient concentration of ATP so it can be used to overcome other energy barriers. Uh, but ATP alone in water um, will undergo hydrolysis. And there are four main reasons for why this is so exergonic. The first is that ATP contains a negative four net charge. And thus it is destabilized by electrostatic repulsion between the oxygens. Second of all, when the gamma phosphate is attacked by water, that removes the phosphate. So then you have ADP, diphosphate, which is a resonant stabilized leaving group. Or in other words, a weak base, which is a good leaving group. So mechanistically, the reaction begins uh, by water forming a hydrogen bond with that most accessible gamma phosphate. And the hydrogen bond is going to take electron density away from oxygen, which is going to in turn take electron density away from phosphorus and make the phosphorus more electrophilic. And now, the oxygen of water can attack the phosphate, do an addition reaction, and then an elimination to free up ADP. So that's a two-step mechanism, such as a carbonyl nucleophilic acyl substitution mechanism is. And that is going to give you ADP, that resonant stabilized leaving group, and the gamma phosphate now has a water molecule attached. And a base can now deprotonate that acidic proton from this inorganic phosphate derivative. To give you hydrogen uh, phosphate which I will abbreviate as PI, inorganic phosphate. So this immediate hydrolysis product here, let me highlight that. The immediate hydrolysis product undergoes a subsequent acid-base reaction, or two, which drive the equilibrium forward, or drive the hydrolysis forward. Because if you have a product that is going on to react further, then you're depleting the product or it keeps the reaction quotient Q low for this reaction. So the final products are inorganic phosphate and ADP and inorganic phosphate is stabilized by four co-equal resonance forms. So a subsequent deprotonation can happen as well. Once again, I, I mentioned that a base in solution can deprotonate one of those acidic protons from water to give you the monohydrogen phosphate form, which is now in equilibrium. I'm going to use the equilibrium arrows, not resonance yet. In equilibrium, if it were to deprotonate again, which it does to some extent, Okay, so when I write inorganic phosphate, I mean an equilibrium mixture of these two compounds. And this inorganic phosphate is especially stable because now it is able to access all four co-equal resonance structures, which describe this PO bond as a bond in a quarter, where the negative charge is dispersed and stabilized. One more factor that is stabilizing that phosphate product and making the reaction irreversible is that, uh, I should say, ADP and phosphate individually, as two molecules, have a larger combined surface area
and anionic charge about that surface area than ATP did originally. That means in aqueous solvent, there are going to be a larger number of hydrogen bonding and dipole-dipole or ion-dipole type interactions. In other words, solvation is going to occur to a greater extent now that we have two anionic molecules in solution. Delta H is exothermic for forming any type of interaction, and that is going to contribute to the exergonicity of hydrolysis. So the oxygens can form hydrogen bonds, be solvated by water, and inorganic phosphate can do the same. where the O minus of each of these phosphate groups is interacting with the electrophilic proton of water. So you get an increased solvation, which overall is stabilizing. So that's our intro to metabolism. Um, for more information on this, you can visit unit two of my biochemistry course guide at chemguides.com.